Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you all for joining us today. Those of you live right here at 128 Boring Street and those of you that are watching from around the world. We got a great service plan for you today. Today is August the 24th, 2019. It is the 23rd day of the Hebrew month of Av. Uh, we are getting close to the fall feast. Uh, just here in one more week, we're going to be in the Hebrew month of Elul. And Elul is 40 days of blowing the shofar, 40 days, uh, or I'm sorry, not 40, but 30, uh, 28, 29, 30 a month worth of repentance. I said 40 because it goes into Yom Kippur. That's what it is. So it's a great time on the Hebrew calendar. You'll probably hear a message here in a couple weeks about repentance. So be expecting that. I always encourage everyone each and every week to go to olivetreemessianic.org. olivetreemessianic.org. You see the slide there in front of you on the video. You see the slide here behind me on the uh, screen as well. This is what our website looks like. If you've never been there, go check it out. Uh, I'm constantly changing things, and I've tried to make the website more simple, a little less cluttered, not as many choices for you, because sometimes choices can deter you and can confuse you. So I've tried to simplify the website. So go and check it out if you've not been there recently. I have our address on there our physical address plus our mailing address, a place for you to donate through PayPal as well. And if you scroll down from there, they can't on this still picture, but if you scroll down from there, you see the T TLV verse of the day. You also see uh, the tour portion outline that I put on there, the tour portion schedule. We try to put everything on this website that you can think of that you will need. So go check it out, olivetreemessianic.org. Okay, today's Torah portion is number 46, Echev, which means because. And the Torah reading can be found in Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, through chapter 11, verse 25. The Haftar reading can be found in Isaiah 49, and you see the readings there on your page or on your screen. I'm not going to continue to read those for you. We just had a great Torah service I encourage you, if you live anywhere near, and when I say anywhere, I'm talking about an hour and a half. We, peep, we have people here that drive an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, Mandy and Alex get the uh, award today for driving the fathers, uh, two hours and 15 minutes. But come and join us. You, if you're local here in the Madisonville, Sweetwater, Teleco Plains area, we are unique. We are different. Come and check us out. If you want a first century, a first Christian style of worship, that's what we have here at the Olive Tree. So come and join us. Amen. Okay, for today's message, I've already let the cat out of the bag. We have some special guests here today from the Tree of Life Bible Society. Those of you who watch us each and every week, you know I use the TLV Bible. I mention it quite frequently. Uh, so if you would please, everybody, give a hand for Alex and Mandy Greenberg Cook. <laughs> Now give your full attention to them. Uh, they're going to not only tell you about the ministry, but they're also going to give you a Bible lesson today as well, okay? So guys, if you would please. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, as, uh, as Pastor just introduced us, my name is Alex Cook. This is my beloved, beautiful, and brilliant wife, Mandy. And um, we're honored to be here today to talk to you a little bit about um, not only what it is that we do at the Tree of Life Bible Society, but also... Um, uh, kind of a, an approach to, uh, well, I don't, want, I don't want to ruin, sorry, those are spoilers. You're going to hear that in a second, though. So I just like to sit here and pray over my wife, and uh, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to chime in as the Spirit leads, because she's phenomenal, and I just need to stay out of her way when she's got the, when she's got the reins. So let us pray. Alvino Shabbat Shemaim, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, God, for the, um, the incredible opportunities that you set before us at the most amazing timing and the perfect moment, God. Because your, your plan is perfect. It stretches up before us like a, it's just a, a fair road under beautiful skies. And uh, it's your path, God, that is straight and perfect. And we're just so honored to be upon it. Um, I ask, Lord, that uh, I lift up my beautiful wife to you. That she, it would be your words that are coming through her mouth, that she would be a megaphone 
for the Holy Spirit that resides in us to go forth before her and, uh, and reach the hearts and the minds of all that are listening with your word and your blessings and your eternal love for us. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, husbands. Alex and I are about to celebrate our fourth anniversary, which is very exciting in just a couple weeks. Um, but hi, my name is Mandy Greenberg Cook, and I am the executive administrator and post production text manager of the Tree of Life version. And that's just a fancy way to say that anytime you see the TLV in print, I had something to do with it. Um, as well as my mother and I are the writers for TLV Treasures and Golden Apples. So all of those crosswords y'all have been doing, I helped make. So I'm glad y'all like them. Very excited. All right, so this morning I really wanted to present uh, one of the things that is a pillar of the Tree of Life Bible Society. If you are not fully acquainted with the Tree of Life Bible Society, uh, we are a small, wild pack of Levites, uh, quite literally, who uh, managed to bring together the Messianic movement as a whole uh, to do a translation of the Bible that was good news from Jews. It's not just, you know, it says that we are here as Jewish people to be a blessing, not just that those who bless us get blessed, but we're here to be a blessing. And so as the ark was carried on the shoulders of the Levites, uh, we we're called by God to carry this TLV text on the shoulders of our family, and we gathered 70 scholars, 34 of which were PhDs in their fields of New Testament studies, Old Testament studies, Greek, Hebrew, Semitic languages, all sorts of stuff. And so we actually got the MJA and the UMJC and Jews for Jesus and Chosen People and the Jewish Voice and uh, Tikkun International. We had all of these Messianic congrega or congregational uh, organizations and evangelical societies who weren't necessarily talking to each other all the time. Uh, we got them to come together and, be, and, and set aside whatever doctrinal and uh, cultural differences they may have had to do the work that God has called us to do um, as Jewish people. Romans 3.2 says that what advantage is there to being Jewish? None, except they were given the sayings of God. And that's uh, one of the things that we wholeheartedly uh, take on and we accept that responsibility. So as part of the Bible Society, um, I get asked a lot about little bits of scripture. Some of them are like super obscure. Some of them are as simple as, well, why don't you guys not eat meat and milk together? Um, you know, there are all sorts of things that we get asked about. And there are certain things that people never ask about. And they never drill down to. And a lot of Bible study today is drilling down to the letter of the itty bitty fowl in the little letter so that you can understand it as best as you can. Except that's not the way God works. See, God works through his word. Hebrew is a pictorial language. God works through pictures and images and examples and stories. And getting down to the jot and tittle and, and the vowels of every single Hebrew word, while that is the calling of many wonderful people in our community, it is not the calling of the Tree of Life Bible Society. Our job is to make uh, people more Bible literate. And so today, we're going to talk about covenants of the Bible. Now, those of you who have been reading the Bible for a while know that there are a lot of covenants, right? We have covenants of repentance. We have covenants of memorial. We have covenants of salt. We have a covenant of uh, royalty. We have covenants that God makes with his people all throughout the scriptures. But there are five specific covenants in the scriptures that are incredibly critical and that don't actually get taught on a whole heck of a lot. So, we're going to look at what makes these five covenants a little heavier and a little more important than the rest of them. So let's start in Genesis. Let's go back to Brasheet. And if y'all could open your Bibles, I would like to hear some pages. If y'all want to open your Bibles. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3 today. Are y'all with me so far? Okay, good. I just want to make sure I'm not losing you. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 15, and this is the beginning of God's covenant with mankind. This is what we at the Bible Society call the seed promise. 
The seed promise is the beginning of all the covenants. So let's read this together. I will put animosity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. So basically, God is saying to Eve, if those of us who know the story, that her seed will be what salvation comes through. There's this beautiful promise that God makes with the seed of the woman in order to make sure that his salvation comes to pass. However, this is not where the covenant itself is cut. What does it take to have a covenant? Can anybody tell me? From their Bible memory, what does it take to cut a covenant? Blood. It takes cutting. Life has to be spilled for life to continue to grow. And so if you uh, jump with me over to uh, Leviticus 17.11, it says, For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your lives. For it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. Now, when we see Adam and Eve leave the garden, we see them leaving, some, leaving wearing something. What were they wearing? They were, okay, they were wearing skins. Where did the skins come from? Animals. It doesn't say in the text that Adam and Eve themselves killed them. It says that God provided skins. So God himself, from what we can interpret, cut a covenant with his creation by providing covering for his, his, this beautiful image of him, the image of God, this imprint of his being that existed in perfection in Eden. And so God himself started covenant with mankind. Now, does that sound like a covenant to everybody? Here's the thing. This is the first actual promise in Scripture that God makes to mankind. Now, we don't actually talk about this a whole lot because the first messianic prophecy is here in Genesis. Messianic prophecy starts in Genesis chapter 3. It's the very first one. And why don't we talk about it a whole lot? We talk about how man fell. We talk about how Eve made a mistake. We talk about how Adam was kind of dumb and went along with it. Just kidding. Um, but covenant is how God makes this seed promise come to pass. And so we start with God himself coming into our space. God himself walked with Adam and Eve, right? So God himself came into our space, into space that we could inhabit, and began this series of covenants. So what we like to call this is the seed promise, because it's not your typical covenant between God and man. It is God making a promise to mankind overall. But next, we're actually going to go a little bit further into Genesis and go to the Noahic covenant. So we're going to go to Noah's story. Most people start with Noah, and there's the animals two by two, and the floods, and the dove, and the crow, and the everything. But if we move over to Genesis 8, we're going to start with Genesis 8.15. And Genesis 8.15 says, Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Come out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Every animal that is with you of all flesh, including the flying creatures, livestock, and every crawling creature that crawls on the land, bring out with you and let them swarm the land and be fruitful and multiply upon the land. So Noah came out with his sons, his wife, and his son's wives. Every animal, every crawling creature, every flying creature, everything that crawls on the land came out of the ark in their families. Families? Did they go into there with families? I don't know. There were just two, but most of them. They came out in families. There was some hanky-panky going on in the ark. Just say it. Then Noah built an altar to Adonai and took of every clean domestic animal and of every clean flying creature and offered burnt offerings on the altar. When Adonai smelled the soothing aroma, he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, even though the inclination of the heart of humankind is evil from youth nor will I ever again smite all living creatures as I have done. Did you notice that there was an altar? There's a sacrifice. There's a shedding of blood and a promise. I'm pretty sure that constitutes as a covenant. So we went from having 
a promise to a man and a woman, a couple, to a whole family. That sounds like an expansion of a covenant. Sounds like an addendum to an agreement. A covenant is a contract, right? When covenants and contracts were cut in the Near East, it would often involve uh, promissory gifts as well as uh, cutting of the hands in order to create a, bl a blood uh, a blood seal. Yes, thank you. So if we look at it, God says that the rainbow will become a sign of this covenant. And so a lot of people tend to look at the rainbow and look at, make it the focus of this story. But the true focus of the Noahic covenant is the fact that there is a promise made after Thanksgiving is given, after a sacrifice is made, and after praise is given to God. There's starting to be a small pattern here. So let's go to the next one. Let's go to Genesis 15. We're going to be in Genesis. This is our last one in Genesis. We're going to go to the Abrahamic covenant. So first we have the seed promise with Adam and Eve. Then we have the Noahic covenant in Genesis 8. And now we have the Abrahamic covenant. Not Abrahamic, Abrahamic. Because it happens before Abram is turned into Abraham. So let's go to Genesis 15. Here we go. Let's start at verse 5. It says, He took him outside and said, Look up now at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. I like to, make, I like to have the voice of God talk like my father, uh, my, my earthly father. I don't know if any of you have had the chance to meet my father, Mark Greenberg, uh, but he is a rabbi of rabbis, and uh, he can get a little sassy. And so that's how I like to think of God in my head, because, you know. Listen, I'm a New York Jew, okay? I moved down here, like, I moved down here, like, seven years ago. I am, they, they put me through Yankee rehab. I think I failed out. I have no idea what's going on. But if you don't have a little bit of attitude, you're not going to get through because us Jews can be a bit stubborn and a little bit obstinate, says my husband as he nods his head quite, quite vigorously. Yeah? Okay. So let's go back to, uh, to verse 5. Then he said to him, so shall your seed be. Then he believed in Adonai, and he, Adonai, reckoned it to him as righteousness. And then he said, I am Adonai who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to give you this land to inherit it. So he said, my Lord Adonai, how will I know that I will inherit it? Then he said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, young cow, a three-year-old she-goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young bird. It's a lot of, lot of animals. And he said, and so he brought all of these to him and he cut them in half and put each piece opposite the other but he did not cut the birds. So we have Abram going and taking these animals and cutting them in half. If you look in your TLV scriptures, you'll see that we uh, had them cut down the middle instead of across because everything God does is in parallel. God works in a binary pattern. Male, female, light, dark. God is very, very consistent, and that's a whole other message that I'm not going to go into today because my mom teaches it so much better than I do. So let's keep going. Then the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. And when the sun was about to set, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Behold, terror of great darkness was falling on him. Then he said to Abram, Adonai said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Yikes. But I am going to judge the nation that they will serve. Afterward, they will go out with many possessions, but you will come to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun set... And it became dark. Behold, there was a smoking oven and a fiery torch that passed between these pieces. Verse 18, let's look at it. On that day, Adonai cut a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your seed from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. The Canaanite, the Kenizzites, there are a lot of these ites. Thankfully, only the Israelites are left. Ha <laughs> ha. 
the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaelites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That's a lot of ites to get rid of. So when in this covenant, we're going to see, we're going to check, out, check it out, check out all the elements to see if we have a covenant here. We have a promise. We have a sacrifice. And we have two parties. We have God of heaven and earth and Abram. Looks like we have a covenant. We've got another covenant. So we always hear about this promise, but we never actually hear why it's important. Because the whole point of this is to create a people that will eventually be born, eventually rise up, eventually come to be, to not only make the name of Adonai great, but also to make sure that the land itself is restored to righteousness for the Lord himself, right? So God's looking at this and going, hey, this land over here, you know, that land needs some cleaning, but my kids aren't going to be ready to clean it. Like, let's just look at it this way. If you have a house and you've got a playroom for your kids, you're not going to be able to ask your kids to clean up the playroom until they're at least about five or six. It's not actually going to get really clean. Three-year-olds, they can put things away. But you're not going to be able to get your uh, children to clean anything before about three years old. Unless you're like really dedicated, uh, which my mother was, so it works out. But th- it's the same way with the children of Israel. The children of Israel weren't even born yet, much less mature enough to do what God needed them to do because they hadn't gone through what they needed to go through to understand that he was God, right? So let's go into our next covenant, which is the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant, if you uh, roll with me over to Exodus 24. Now, before I go into this, can anybody tell me what the most common story about the Exodus after leaving Egypt is? What's the most common thing that we know of about Moses and our time in Egypt? Parting of the Red Sea, Ten Commandments, Golden Calf. Were any of those where God cut a covenant with his people? Nope. That's not where it happened. That's not where it happened. It didn't happen at any of those. Can you believe that? Those are the three stories we know the most about, and yet that's not the actual story of the covenant of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob cutting a covenant with the the 1.5 million person tribe nation that is Israel. And it actually happens in Exodus 24. So let's go there. Exodus 24, verse 1. It says, Then Moses, then to Moses he said, Come up to Adonai, you and Aharon, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, to, and worship from afar. Moses alone is to approach Adonai, but the others may not draw near him, nor are the people to go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of Adonai, as well as all the ordinances. All the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that Adonai has spoken we will do. Well, that sounds like a little bit of an agreement, but there's no blood yet, so let's keep going. So Moses wrote down all the words of Adonai, then rose up early in the morning and built an altar. Ooh, we're getting there. Along with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent out young men of B'nai Israel who sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings of oxen to Adonai. Then, and here comes the icky part, but it's okay because this is the foundation of everything we believe, quite frankly. Then Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and the other half he poured out against the altar. He took the scroll of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. Again they said, All that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. That sounds like a ratification of an agreement. If anyone here knows anything about Murphy's rules, uh, laws of order, uh, you have to have a motion, and then you have, to, you have to ask for a motion, and then you have to have a motion, and then you have to have someone second to that motion, and then you have to have a vote on it, and then you have to have everybody all in favor, and then you have to have, uh, make sure that it goes through unanimously. It's very complicated. I advise everyone to read it because, quite frankly, uh, it helps me keep my life in order. 
rules of order. God, everything we do, God gives us rules of order. And that's what his word is for. And so, everything, all that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. Then Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which Adonai has cut with you in agreement with these words. Whew. That Adonai has cut with you in agreement of these words. It wasn't just that the children of Israel cut a covenant with God. They didn't just go up to him and say, hey, uh, you know, we'll obey you if you take care of us and make sure we're okay. It was God saying, here are the rules of the land. Here's my house rules. If you're into it, say okay, and I'll take care of you. It was a to it's a totally different dynamic when you realize that God himself laid out all of these things for us. And one of the things that's really, really fun is that the Torah reading that was done this morning uh, in Deuteronomy 7 was exactly the part that I was going to read. So I know that God had this little message ordained. I'm really excited about it. So, so if we look at the idea of covenant according to the Old Testament, according to uh, ancient Near Eastern tradition, we're looking at something where there's a system of behavior, a shedding of blood to ratify it, and then an agreement that both parties adhere to. If you guys ever um, want to dive deeper into what God's uh, response was to all of these things. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown has a fantastic book called Israel's Divine Healer. I did an entire course on it in seminary. It's phenomenal. You should definitely pick it up. Um, but the thing that's so fascinating is that right before God gives these tablets, these rules, to Moses, he makes the people agree to them. And so, better yet, we have this amazing covenant that's been cut and it actually parallels the covenant that was cut through Yeshua. And so that is our next one. But first I want to look at Deuteronomy 7, real quick. Have I lost any of you? Okay, good. So if we go back to Deuteronomy 7.12, it says, Then it will happen as a result of your listening to these ordinances, when you keep and do them, that Adonai your God will keep with you the covenant kindness that he swore to your fathers. I just want to sit there for a second. What does covenant kindness mean? Can anybody tell me what covenant kindness feels like? Like if you're married, if there's safety, there's provision, there's protection. A covenant kindness is to say, you messed up, but I still love you. A covenant kindness is to say, you're sick, but I'm going to make you soup. You know, a covenant kindness is, is to say, oh, you know, I, I guess you're going to go down that road. I'll be here when you're done. God does that with us all the time. And so one of the great words um, in Hebrew is chesed. And if you read the TLV, you'll notice that we don't translate the word chesed. We leave it transliterated. And that's because the word chesed is far too large a term to actually have one meaning. It means anywhere from covenant loyalty and covenant kindnesses to mercy and uh, grace. And there's a whole spectrum of meaning to chesed. And so one of the things that's really interesting is that it's God's grace and God's mercy to give us these rules. Pagan gods would never ever tell their people what to do, so they do anything to get the attention of their god. If they worshipped Molech, they would sacrifice their children. They would do anything. If you look at, the, at Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they would cut themselves and hurt themselves and aff afflict themselves to try and get their God to respond. The only thing we need to do to get our God to respond is obey. There is, that is such an amazing point of grace. You have no idea. Because if you enter into a relationship with God, if you enter into a relationship with anyone, there are rules of and regulations. There are terms of engagement, and God outlines every single one of them for his people. Yeah. And there's this amazing gentleness that happens when God gives you rules, when you know where the boundaries are. Yeah. You know that these walls are the boundaries of the sanctuary. Yeah. 
If you need to go to the bathroom, you don't do it in these, ba- in these boundaries. You go out there. You go into that room over there. When you're on the road, you have lanes because those are the boundaries. Those are the rules. Those are the laws to keep you safe. So God not only gave us this Torah, gave us this word in order to keep us safe, but he's given us covenants over and over and over again just to make sure that we're really in it to win it. From the beginning, the dawn of time, since Adam and Eve, God was like, all right, I got you, but you guys got to agree to this. And they said, okay. And then when Noah came along, he said, all right, you obviously got this. Yes, husband. If I might. Absolutely. I love my husband because he is incredibly wise and discerning for me. I get a little excited, much like my mother, if any of you have met her. And you are out of the live stream, my love. I apologize. Uh, Well, what you're saying reminded me. um, There was a news article uh, some years ago. uh, It was talked about how there was a uh, a one block um, area in the middle of the city, and there is a children's playground in the dead center of it. And when the kids um, would play, they'd always stay immediately just around the playground. Somebody eventually realized that surrounding kids with a bunch of streets and busy traffic was probably not the very safest thing they could be doing. So they went and installed fences all the way around the perimeter. And what they noticed was once the fences were up, the kids would spread out to the very edges to play. They would have all that room because they knew where the line was. They knew what was safe for them and they knew what wasn't safe. And that's what God's commandments, I think, can do for us. Absolutely. Is um, it tells us what the right thing is. It tells us what the wrong thing is. And we know uh, we have freedom in that. We have grace in that Mm -hmm. so that we can go out and fulfill the work of the Lord without having to be fearful of tripping into a whole snarl of ungodly things and getting lost along the way. Amen. Thank you, husband. He's so smart. I married him for his big brains. Actually, we had trouble finding a keeper for him for his, for our marriage or wedding because That's good, honey. he has a. Love you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I digress. So so far, we have a covenant made to a couple. We have a covenant made to a family. Then, when we get to Abram, we have a covenant made with a tribe to generations. Now, here at the Mosaic Covenant, we have a covenant made with a people with a nation. And so as time is progressing, as we are getting to know the Lord just this much more, this covenant is expanding. And it's expanding at a fairly exponential rate uh, if you consider, you know, the whole of time and space. No big deal. Um, And so that brings us to the actual fulfillment of all of these covenants and the everlasting covenant in Yeshua our Messiah. If you would go with me to, if you would go with, oh, no, I don't have it in here. So just as uh, Moses presented these rules to the people, and the people said, everything you do, we we will do. You know, sprinkle us, bring it on. Bring on the time, whatever it takes, we will do. If we actually go to when Yeshua is before Pilate. And they say, who do you want? Who do you want? Do you want Barabbas or do you want Yeshua? And they say, we want Barabbas. And they said, are you sure? Are you positive? And they said, of course, we want Barabbas. Let the other guy's blood be on our heads. Yikes. Do you know what what they they said? They, they, They ratified another covenant that they would take Yeshua's blood on their own heads. And they didn't even know what they were doing. So if you go with me to Hebrews 9, which Pastor was like already on top of earlier, talking about Hebrews 9, 10, and 11. If we go to Hebrews 9, verse 11, it says, But when Messiah appeared as Kohen Gadol, of all the good things that have now come, passing through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, he entered the holies once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sprinkling, take note, 
who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, in order that those called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has taken place that redeems them from the violations under the first covenant. For where there is a covenant, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a covenant is secured upon the basis of dead bodies, since it has no strength as long as the one who made it lives. Meaning, if you're going to make a covenant, something's got to die. Whether you put that on a scapegoat or a scape bull or whatever it is, it's got to die. That is why not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken to Moses, to all the people according to the Torah, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And nearly everything is purified in blood according to the Torah. Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So if we look at it again, it starts with a man and his wife. And then it moves to a family. And then it moves to a tribe. And then it moves to a nation. And now it's the whole world. And this is one of the things that is is just so spectacular about what we do here at the Tree of Life Bible Society. Because it's our job, again, as Levites. Uh, My great-grandfather told us that we were from the tribe of Levi, although uh, his entire village in Poland was wiped out in the Holocaust, so we don't have a whole lot of records. Um, It's... God's grace that he gave us the Torah in the first place. It's God's continued grace that he gave us Yeshua. That not only has he ratified and placed an addendum on all of these covenants, but that he has opened the covenant to all mankind. And so while we do our job to carry the word of God, we want to enable you to do your job. And so Part of why we exist and part of what we do is to help families understand how it is to make an altar for themselves. And so part of what we're doing here at the Bible Society is that we uh, have started the Family Altar Initiative. And the Family Altar Initiative, you don't have to use our Bible, you don't have to do anything, but we want you to consider making a place of memorial, a place of repentance, a place of uh, remembrance for what God has done for you in your own home. Just as altars were, pla- were, were built by uh, Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joshua and Elijah, all of these people built altars to remember things and to present these moments with God. And Jacob did it when God visited him from heaven and called it like, there are so many altars throughout scripture. But why did we stop? Why do we stop making them? There's no reason to stop making altars. And if God's word is not the altar of your home, there might be something missing. You have to lay a cornerstone. It can't just be something figurative because then you won't remember it. You have to keep God's word in the forefront of our minds. It's why we wear the talises. It's why we wrap to fill in. It's why we have the mezuzahs on the doorposts. It's why we do what we do. All of our traditions, all of our cultural things, they're all for the sake of remembering our God. None of them are just because they sound like a good idea. I know my husband is sweating under that talis right now. He's not wearing it just because it's a good idea. He's wearing it because it makes him feel closer to God. I don't put a mezuzah on my doorpost just because it looks pretty, even though it really does. It's a very, very pretty mezuzah. I don't put it there just because. I put it there because God told me to, number one. And number two, every single time I pass by it, I remember his commandments. We don't come here. We don't come to services every Saturday just because it's nice to see all y'all's faces. When, I, when, when Alex and I are at home, at our, uh, our home fellowship, we show up to our offices for Bible study and worship every single Saturday morning. It doesn't matter if there are four people or 40. It doesn't matter because we're there because God told us to be. And we're there because if we don't go, then we're lacking. 
And we Shabbat, we light the Shabbat candles, not because they're mandated, but because they mark a time and space that we can adhere to God's covenant with us, that God made Shabbat for us, not us for Shabbat. And so we do all of these little things. We have all of these little, little nuances, all of these prayers. Every single time that there's a prayer to open up the ark, we're remembering God. Every time there's a prayer to open up the service, we're, you're, you're remembering God. Every single time that you say a blessing before or after a meal, don't care either way. I usually do it after because it's, you know, hilarious to watch people kind of spaz out a little bit. But that's just my own personal amusement. Um, but there are all these small things that tell the world who we belong to. It tells the world whose covenant we abide by. And so I want you all to, this is my, my closing encouragement, is that you have to find a place in your home that is sacred, that you go to when you need to get on your face before God, when you, where you go and you have a book of remembrance, whether it's a Bible, because this particular Bible has a journal in the back, NBD. Ooh. Whether it's my family, we have a big, big journal that we kept years and years of our book of remembrance. It says actually in Torah to keep a book of remembrance so that you can remember all the amazing things that God does for you. And so find a place, set a cornerstone, and remember to influence your family because your family really is your first, your first uh, mission field. If you don't teach your children, if you don't hold yourselves accountable, and, and part of the reason why I love the fact that the kids are here is because kids keep parents accountable. I know, I know that's, hard to, that's hard to hear sometimes, but if, uh, if your, your five-year-old is in the service with you and he hears the pastor say, don't hit mommy, and then you hit mommy, and your five-year-old goes, pastor said you shouldn't hit mommy. And uh, that's pretty convicting. And I use that extreme of an example because there are a lot of other examples I could use and I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, make anybody feel anything. But when we look at what God has done, he has grafted each and every one of us, even those of us from the wild olive tree. I am, I am 57% Jewish, 34% Italian, and like 6% Irish, English, French, okay? Like, I'm, I, I'm pretty much as Ashkenazi Jewish as it gets in my generation because intermarriage and all that stuff. Okay, so, but even I've been grafted back in. Even I've been put back into the olive tree. And this is one of the things that I love about this community is that you guys are so excited to be, be part of this covenant. And when someone asks you going forward, how do I keep track of all these covenants? How do I keep track of it? I have a cute little book. I have little symbols. They're very cute. So I don't know if you, any of you can see this. You can come see me at the table afterwards. But our story with God starts with the tree in the garden. It starts with God providing for us. And it goes to a seed promise. And from the seed promise, we go to the promise with Noah. We have a little rainbow to remember that God promised not to wipe out the earth. And then we go to the stars, the three stars in the sky, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, in Judaism, Shabbat doesn't start until there are three stars in the sky. And that's why, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we go to the Torah written on our hearts with the Mosaic Covenant. And then we have Yeshua, the covenant of the kingdom, our covenant kingdom. And in that, we can live in the kingdom here and now. We can live in his grace and his power and his might and his love every single day. And every single time that you go into Shabbat, every single time that you show up here, you are walking into the kingdom space. And I just want you guys to remember that this right here, this is not of this world. This is a slice of the kingdom on earth, and it is a blessing every single time. So my husband and I are going to be in the back. I hope this has been fun for you. I know I talk kind of fast because I'm from New York. I apologize. But I'm working on it because my husband's from down here. So if you have any questions, um, if I can take like two minutes for questions, if that's okay. Does anybody have any questions? Just like two minutes.
No? Does anybody want to know anything about the Bible? I mean, I study it for a living. It's what I do. Does anybody have any Bible questions? I got a question. Go ahead. Not about the Bible, but about the, uh, your ministry. Yes, sir. What all products do you provide other than just the Bible? Because maybe somebody has a Bible already, yes. but you offer much more than that. Uh, we do. I actually did not bring a whole lot today um, because I only have uh, one trunk, and there's only so much that can fit in it. But we have, not only do we have Bibles, we have uh, family Bibles, like our big shiny brick back there um, that's nine pounds, home defense and spiritual defense. Get done. There you go. Amen. You can take someone out with that bad boy. Um, but you can go to our TLV uh, Bible Society website as well as the TLV Bible app. If you don't have the TLV Bible app, I suggest that you download it now because... Not only can you read your Torah portion, you can hear my father reading it to you, as Pastor said earlier. Um, but we also have the blessings. We have a calendar option. We have planners. Uh, we have uh, testimony books. We have Bibles. We have all sorts of fun things. We even have some jewelry today with each of these little symbols on it so that you can remember your covenants. We have these little things on bracelets. My husband is wearing one. And so you can remember the covenants so that you can always remember... Um, we like to call it modern tefillin because it is, it is leather and it does remind you of the covenant that God gave you. It's just like, not like all the way up here. So, yes. Okay, I have a question. Yes, sir. Did I answer your question okay? I've got like you, bunches of stuff. Go to the did, website. Correct. You can find it. Okay. Why does the Bible God wrote Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, I will tell you that. Amen, amen, and amen. Okay. In the, in the Hebrew, in the Aramaic, there is no variation. Amen, amen, I tell you. That is what Yeshua says. Instead of verily, verily, it's amen, amen, I tell you, which means from beginning to end. So that's, that's a little tidbit. But the transliteration is all about dialect. So you have your Sephardic Jews who come from Spain, Morocco, Italy, um, the Mediterranean, all of those. They do their transliterations one way, which is the A-M-A-N kind of thing. Amen. Uh, amen. Um, and then you have your Ashkenazi Jews who are from Poland, Russia, Austria, those they, and they do the A-M-E-I-N because they add the extra vowel. Amen. Um, um, amen. Like Adonai. Adonai is very, very Ashkenazi. Um, if you go up to New York City and you go to a, a synagogue, you will hear uh, pretty much everything is Adonai. There's a lot. And, and that is purely because of Yiddish, because Yiddish is actually German, Polish, and Hebrew all mixed into one language. So when you mix those three languages, you get a lot of amalgamation of vowels, because the Polish language has way too many vowels. Good Lord, my sister-in-law is Polish, and even she'll admit that there are too many vowels. <laughs> so when you're looking at transliteration, um, it's, not, it's not indicative of a variance in the actual word itself. It's just the way people want to say it. Um, even even in, in the Torah service, there were variations on... Um, it's very much pronunciation, it's dialect, um, and it's also the mother tongue of the translators because if you come from a more romantic language, you'll transliterate it differently. Um, if you come from a more uh, Cyrillic language, you'll translate it differently, and if you come from a Germanic language, it'll tra be transliterated differently. And so that's literally all it is. <laughs> I'm glad to help you. Yes, Miss Rosie, that's my niece's name. It's a beautiful name. Yes. So you're asking about what the difference is between translations? I'm an expert in this subject, so it's a good thing you asked. Translation, Bible translation, is a spectrum. Um, when you look at the original languages in the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, uh, most of us don't read Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Some of us, like Bill, may read Hebrew, but uh, those of us who don't are kind of at a loss. 
Um, but it also takes knowing the culture. It takes understanding um, the contexts to really uh, get the interpretations out that are supposed to be there. So when you're translating a, translating a Bible from the original manuscripts into another language, you have a spectrum. On one side of the spectrum, you have as word for word as possible. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got as thought for thought for, as possible. So what you've got between is a literal and a dynamic equivalent. So a dynamic equivalent would, would be like um, if, the word, if the sentence in, in the original manuscript was dog eat fish, in uh, the word for word it was the dog eats the fish. But in a dynamic equivalent, it would be like, and the dog ate the fish, and the fish was good. Like, because there's some dynamic, there's some contextual clues that they put into it. So when you have this spectrum, the more literal something is, the clunkier it is to read. So the more word for word you get, the less easy it is to read. The more thought for thought you get, the easier it is to read. Because we're like, oh, I understand that concept. I'll just, just absorb that. So on your word-for-word -word side, you've got the New American Standard Bible. And from there, it's about like the ESV, the RSV, those ones that are a little bit, you know, just a little bit more taxing to read because they're not as uh, easy on the grammatical sentence structure. And then you've got your thought, for, your thought for Thought, which is your NLT, your Complete Jewish Bible, your Message Bible, your Scriptures Bible. Um, those are more of the dynamic equivalent paraphrase side of the spectrum. In the middle is where most people want to be if they're doing a vetted translation. Does everybody know what I mean when I say vetted? Okay, thank you for saying no, because not everybody will admit that. A vetted translation means that it's been argued over, it's been... Uh, it's been just basically just ramshackle ran over until like just put in a tumble dryer until somebody comes up with a decision. Um, it's been <laughs> through um, everybody's biases have been heard. Everybody's just, everybody's gone back and forth. They've looked at all the manuscripts. They've looked at all the theological doctrines behind it and they've adhered to the key principles and they've made a decision. So we had 34 PhDs who were part of that vetting process. It's a lot of arguing. There's a lot of conversations and a lot of discussions for every single word. And so, because e not every single word in the Bible can be translated the same exact way every single time. Because again, Hebrew is a pictorial language. It has a lot of different meanings. So what you want to be is in the middle of, of the spectrum, okay? So in the middle of the spectrum, you have your King James, your NIV, you've got your uh, Holman Bible, and in the middle, but more towards the word-for-word -word side, you have your TLV. Um, and that's because we want it to be as accurate as the New American Standard, we want it to be as reverent as the King James, and we want it to be as readable as the NIV. I'm pretty sure we, we got pretty close to that. Um, thank you, Pastor, I appreciate that. Um, because what we did was we maintained the uh, sentence structures and the syntax and the grammatical uh, ways that the original languages uh, put it in. So if you look in the New Testament, fun fact, the New Testament in Greek is actually written in the historical present tense, which is why the tenses change in the middle of the sentence, because that's what it does in the manuscripts. And people are like, oh my gosh, they, they, I actually got an email the other day, your, your translation is so American, it's so self-focused, and changes tenses all the time, it's very hard for us internationals. And I, and I just was like, well, that's how the original manuscripts were written, so... I'm pretty sure that's an international manuscript, so I'm pretty sure it's going to be okay, guys. Um, but yeah, so basically, it's just a big old spectrum. And if you ever want to uh, learn more about that, you can go to Biblica.com. Um, Biblica is one of, the, uh, one of the main resources for comparative Bibles, uh, Bible comparisons. So you can go there, and they've got all sorts of fun stuff. So, is there anything else before Pastor Richie comes up here and is like super excited because he has a present to share? No yes, sir. The Hebrew idioms. We actually keep a lot of them. 
We actually keep a lot of the Hebrew idioms because, and we'll, we always put it in the footnotes down below, um, but a lot of the Hebrew idioms are there because they lend contextual clues um, to the meta narrative of Scripture. Because when you go from Genesis to Revelation, there are things that are in there that if you hadn't heard them in Exodus, you, they won't make sense to you in Mark or Luke. And so that's why the Hebrew idioms have uh, maintained, which is also why we did um, some Hebrew transliteration in the New Covenant, because we wanted to make that uh, contextual connection between uh, the uh, culture of Abraham and Moses to the culture of Yeshua and uh, Rav Shaul. So yeah, so you'll see a lot of them in there, but there will always be a note in the footnotes. And if you ever, I'll just put this out there, if you ever see like a missing verse um, or there's something misnumbered, it's on purpose because the Hebrew canon and the Protestant canon are different things. And if you want to learn more about that, you can come see me afterwards. But I think, is there anybody else? Because I'll be here all afternoon. I've got three questions. Since you're up there and you're live, hey. Uh, Bring it on. First of all, for those who don't know, how many translators help translate the TLD? 70. 70. I have, I have a team of 70 people, 34 of which are PhDs. So um, the 34 PhDs did the majority of the translation work. We have some people who are MDivs, um, who have Masters of Divinity, Masters of Education, um, who helped with the process. But there were, overall, there was a team of 70 people who did uh, the majority of all the work, including our copy editors and all of that. So very thorough translation, not just one person's idea of what the Correct. translation should be. And part of, part of the reason why we got someone from all the Messianic organizations is so that we wouldn't have any um, doctrinal biases hardwired into the text. Um, if you get a translation that is done by one person, they inevitably insert some of their own teachings and ideas into the text itself, which can be somewhat dangerous because it's the word of God and it needs to be maintained and have a certain level of uh, a certain standard of existence. So, Okay, next question. Yes. Can you explain to everyone why the Old Testament, the Tanakh books, are in a different order? Yes. Yes, I can. The Tanakh. Does, can anybody tell me what Tanakh stands for? Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Tanakh is the law, the prophets, and the writings. And so what was, so basically they, the Jewish canon of scripture is the first five books of Moses and then all the prophets. And then after that is all the writings. So you have your wisdom writings, your Meg Megillah writings, your Psalms and your Proverbs and all of those. Those, are all, those all come after the prophets. So when the Protestant Bible was put together, uh, they were like, you know what? This doesn't make sense because this isn't chronological. We should just, just mix them up so that people can get a better idea. However, when you do that, you change the narrative of Scripture. You change the narrative that God had the rabbis put together. And so um, the funny thing is that a lot of people think that Daniel was a prophet. He is not. Daniel was a historian. Ezra and Nehemiah, historians. Uh, you've got your books of Ruth and Esther and Lamentations and Ecclesiastes and all of those, and those are all part of the histories. Um, but somehow, Chronicles isn't in with second, first and second Kings and first and second Samuel. Chronicles is at the end. So why is Chronicles at the end? I will tell you. Thank you for asking. It was a beautiful question. Why is Chronicles at the end? Chronicles is at the end because it's when the foreign king says, let anyone who wants to go up to the house of Adonai go and be, be, uh, be allowed to go do that. And instead of it ending with Malachi, as most Protestant Bibles do, actually, come with me to Malachi. Come with me to Malachi. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, you don't literally have to come with me, but I'm going to go to Malachi. Just because it's fun for me. So if we go to Malachi and we look at the end of it, now Malachi is not a hugely fun book. Okay. But if you are a Christian, a Gentile Christian, and you're thinking, well, we've got to put this Bible in order so that people know to be on the lookout for Jesus, right? 
You'd think that, you know, we're going to print, you know, seven million copies of it. The Bible is the best-selling book in the world. Amen? Uh, we're going to... This is going to go everywhere. It's going to be the, the word of God. Everybody's going to do it. How do we tell people to look for the Savior? So they put Malachi at the end. And so Malachi says at the end of Malachi 3 in verse 24. Actually, we'll start in verse 23. It says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of Adonai. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Sounds great, right? Except we come to this, else I will come and strike the land with utter destruction. Well, that's a bummer. That's, that's a deterrent. Because most Jews don't want to believe in Yeshua. So if that's what you're going to tell them is believe or die, basically, it's a big deal. I, I, you, I got you. It's hard. I can tell. I, I completely agree with that. I think the way he's been presented is as an Egyptian, like Joseph. Yep, yep. Absolutely. That wall absolutely goes, it, it stops them from going over. So if you turn with me to Second Chronicles, you'll see part why we restored the Jewish canon. Because the Jewish canon of Scripture, at the end... So if the last word of Malachi is destruction or curse in some, in some of them, if you look at the end of Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, verse 23. Now this is King Cyrus of Persia. King Cyrus of Persia was anointed by God, a foreign king, to help the Jews put the temple back together, the second temple. It says, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, Adonai, the God of heaven and earth, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever among you of all his people may go up, and may Adonai, his God, be with him. That's a much better ending than striking you with a curse. Wouldn't you agree? So, what we wanted to do, and if you look in your TLV Bible, there is no page saying, oops, there go my notes. There's no page saying New Testament because it's all one testament. It's God's testament. This is not two stories. There go all of my all of my notes. All of my notes, just flinging them everywhere. This is not two stories. It's one story. Genesis to Revelation and back to Genesis again and back to Revelation and back to Genesis. Everything we do as Jewish people and as the children of God, as part of B'nai Israel, which every single person in this room is part of, is that we do a cyclical life with God. We go from seed time to harvest, to seed time to harvest, to seed time to harvest, from Rosh Hashanah to Passover, from Passover to Rosh Hashanah. And so when you go from Genesis to Deuteronomy, 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 you learn things every single time. Every single time. And it's the same thing with the rest of Scripture is that as you go through it, you learn new things over and over and over again because it is living and active. All right, question number three. Okay, question number three. Why did, and then we'll get Christie's question, but why did the TLV so correctly, might I add, and reverently choose to use the word Adonai instead of trying to pronounce the name? That's an excellent question. Thank you. When presented with the choice of what to use instead of the Tetragrammaton, our theology team looked at Jewish culture, looked at what our people have been doing for centuries, and really wrestled over whether to use Hashem, which means the name, or to use Adonai, or uh, to use something else. Because we wanted to maintain that reverence for the four-letter unspoken name of God. Instead of trying to put vowels on it, which at the Bible Society we wholeheartedly do not believe in um, because it's unpronounceable for a reason. Um, and uh, my mother likes to say that she believes that God's name sounds like thunder and none of us can exactly replicate the sound of thunder. Um, so that's, that's, her little, that's her little thing. But uh, so we used Adonai... Because one, for us, it's a bit more reverent than just the name. 
Um, and so our theologians were like, well, Adonai is already in the scripture. Hashem doesn't really show up um, in scripture itself. So Adonai was already in the biblical text. Um, and it also what we wanted to do is we formatted it uh, the same way that the King James does. If you ever look in your King James, NIV, whatever, you'll see Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, just the O-R-D is smaller. That is every time that the Tetragrammaton shows up. But then they do it the same way as capital L, lowercase o, lowercase r, lowercase d, for whenever it's just Adon, which is just Lord. So we used Adonai as a way to maintain reverence as well as to allow people to read the scriptures without getting tripped up by uh, attempting to pronounce yod heh he, or to do some, a, a name that they've never called on before. Most Bible readers um, have never called on, on Hashem. Um, a lot of, uh, almost 90% of Jews have. Um, and so we wanted to bridge that gap. And that's why we did that. So. No, actually God chose the 70. It's the craziest story. We, had, we, were, we started out with 12, um, which was a God thing in and of itself, and then it multiplied to 40, and then it multiplied to 70. And we were like, oh, well, this must be a God thing. So God did that um, just because it, that's the way God works. See, if you, if you keep reading the Bible, if you, uh, if you come to understand the character of God through his word, after many, many years of doing this and living in this cyclical pattern, you'll see God has, God's pretty predictable, like about 75% of the time. And part of the reason that we believe that is because when we do things in order, God can break out of that order and do things that are just phenomenally supernatural. So in our family, we say God only works out of order, out of order. So that's, that's how we do that. And, uh, it's, believe me, it was a, this is a, a, a almost 12 year journey and it has been very intense every step of the way, but God has been incredibly, incredibly kind. Um, we say the Shehekianu every single time um, we have the anniversary because God literally brings us to this season every single time um, and, and there's no other way to ex describe it other than his divine grace, so. Any other questions, Marion? Bring it on. Lay it on me. That's a very, very complicated question. That's a very, very complicated question. When it comes to restoring a family tree, you have to take the dead branches and graft them back in. And personally, it's very hard to answer that question because as the daughter of Jews, as a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, as the great-granddaughter of survivors of the Spanish Inquisition, why the heck would God let our people go through all of this if there wasn't a purpose? And if, if we're all just going to get saved at the end anyway, why would he, why would he let, allow this much torment? It's very hard. Um, and it's not a question I actually know how to answer, I'll be honest, because all have fallen short of the glory and all need salvation. I don't know what's going to happen in the day of the Lord. I don't know who's going to get a free pass and who's not. But in the parable of the virgins, we know that those who are unprepared don't get to, get to, don't get to go to the wedding feast, which is incredibly sad for me, which is why we do what we do, and which is why the TLV Bible Society exists, is because if we aren't doing our job as Yehudim, as Yehudim literally meaning to praise, the, the, the praising ones. If we don't do our job to proclaim his name, which is the entire reason we exist as Jews, 
is because we're not chosen just because it's fun to be chosen. It's definitely not fun to be chosen. Can I just say that? Internet, it's not fun to be chosen. Being Jewish is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, it's, it's just not. It's not that great. I, part of me would not want this life because it's hard. Um, but if we don't do our job to make his name known, to carry his word on our shoulders, and to be a living testament of his greatness and his goodness, because no matter what, we're still here. As I said earlier, out of all the ites, the Israelites are the only ones left. And so without that testimony, you know, it's, it's hard for anyone to believe in a God who can't sustain his people. We've been sustained through 3,400 years of persecution, slavery, uh, war, death, famine. God's still maintained a remnant all these years. And we're here today and our land is flourishing, and our people are growing, and everywhere we go, we're a blessing to the nation that has us until the enemy, you know, twists it and they kick us out, which is pretty, pretty common. Um, but now that we have our own homeland and we have a place to return to, um, I know that for myself, I don't, I don't want to make Aliyah to Israel because I'm more of a blessing here in America than I would be in Israel. And I feel like I can do my job as a Jewess, as the future mother of Israel that I'm hoping to be in the next couple of years. Um, husband. Oh, no, no. I just had surgery about three, uh, two and a half months ago so that we can get to that. So, um, But we are, but there's, there's a, a mandate on those of us who are part of the tribe. And all of us who are grafted into B'nai Israel all have that responsibility as well. And so when it comes to figuring out who's going to be here and who's going to stay behind and, you know, who the 144,000 are and, you know, when it comes to figuring all that out, honestly, I have no idea. Because eschatology is not my jam. I would rather study Genesis all day than study Revelation, because honestly, I believe, no, and I'll, I'll be truthful, I'll be truthful, I believe that Revelation is, is God's version of a storybook. It's like reading a storybook to a child, and, and they can understand concepts when you put them in these grandiose things. When you read a child the story of the three little bears, not that there were actually three bears talking to Goldilocks, they understand the story of don't eat other people's porridge, you know? Um, so for us at the Bible Society, um, our entire focus is education, evangelism, and edification. That's what we do. And we do it through the scriptures, through art, through lifestyle, um, because living a Shabbat lifestyle, the way that this community does, where you have Shabbat, you do Shabbat, and then you have six days of secular uh, life. We, at our house, we have five days of work, we have one personal day, and then we have Shabbat. And then we go straight into the next work week. That's how it works at the Greenberg House. If you wanna learn how to do it, talk to me, because we have a planner for that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> if y'all wanna join the Shabbat life train, I'm here to help. Um, but yeah, so it, that's a very hard question, and I'm really grateful you, ans you asked it, because... I can understand. There's always more to the story. There's always more to the story. There's always, always, always more. So for me, um, one of the things I learned as a missionary was Jews for Jesus. Shout out Jews for Jesus. They're good people, very good people is that when people ask questions that there are no answers to, it's because there's a deeper question underneath it. Like when people would ask me, why isn't there peace in the world? Why is it, if, if Jesus really was the Messiah, why didn't he bring world peace? And the real question underneath that one is, why don't I have peace? Why, why am I so troubled? Why am I in so much pain? If God is loving and gracious and kind, why are there orphans starving in Africa and Venezuela? Why is there murder and gang violence? Why are there people dying all over the world? I mean, that's not the real question. The real question is, why did X, Y, or Z happen to me? Why was I traumatized? Why was I hurt? Where was God for me? And so when people say that, there's an underlying thing that they're trying to convince themselves of to make sure that they don't get hurt. 
because there's, if, if, they, if they let go of it, then they won't know who they are. So that would be the thing to pray about. Anything else? Any other questions? You guys in the old neck room, you got any questions? Can you hear back there? All right. Are we good? Are we good, everybody? All right. Everybody give a hand to Mandy. Thank, thank you for you coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. And, and Alex and I will be here uh, for the rest of the afternoon to answer any questions, concerns, or if you need any Bibles, because we have those too. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for bringing all these Bibles. Uh, before we close out our live stream, as we always do each and every week, I want to bless everyone with the ironic benediction. So if everyone would please rise. And hey, I want to give a shout out to a group that's uh, listening in North Carolina, a uh, Messianic Women at Home group. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Oh, they're all over the world, so praise God. So thank you guys for listening. Hopefully you're still tuning in. I should have said this at the beginning, but, uh, but thank you all. Share this message, by the way. Share this uh, testimony and this teaching. Chloe, if you would please show them the TLV website one more time. Uh, it's the TLV, TLVBibleSociety.org. You see it there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please go and check them out. Uh, find them on Facebook. And are you guys on YouTube? Uh, not yet. Not yet. So find them on Facebook. Good, good. Uh, make sure and go share their, their verse of the day on YouTube or Facebook, I'm sorry, and so on and so on. Okay, let us bless one another with the ironic benediction. If you're here live with us, we're just closing out our video. We will continue momentarily uh, with a time of prayer and announcements and then Oneg. Yavarekaka Adonai Vayishmareka Yaher Adonai Penaveleka Vikuneka Yisa Adonai Penaveleka Vayasim lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua our Messiah, our Sar Shalom, our Prince of Peace. Amen. And all main. God bless you all. Thank you all for watching today. Shavua Tov. Have a good week. Shabbat Shalom.